um, I just want to share with you uh, uh, briefly what the Lord has been speaking to my heart. And I was praying the other day, uh, um, you know, Lord, what, what word do you have for me to bring uh, for Sunday? You know, I was just really seeking the face of God, trying to figure out what it was that he'd have for me to share with you. And I kept hearing the word emerge emerge, emerge, emerge. And that word just kept coming back to the surface. And so I pulled out my Bible, started looking through, uh, and, and what popped out to me was the story of David when he's hiding. And this is during the time, uh, that he has already been anointed to be the king of Israel, that that's already happened, but there's that long span of waiting. If you know the story of David, there's a long span of waiting from the time that he uh, receives that word over his life that he is anointed to be the next king until the time that it actually takes place. And there's a good chunk of this time in the waiting where he is in hiding and he is waiting for the Lord to open up that time for him to come forth and step into that anointing. And a lot of this can be found um, in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. If you want to dive in, I wish that I had time to go through this whole story with you this morning, but we're just going to be touching on different parts. But I encourage you, just like I encourage you with anybody else, don't listen to just a preacher's words. Get in the word for your own self. And so I'm going to tell you this morning that since I can't get in and I can't read this entire story to you, I want you to get in the word in your own time and make sure that my words are correct. Amen. And so we're going to be uh, jumping around a little bit in 1 and 2 Samuel. I just want to share a few points here and there, but I'm going to fill in the gaps and share with you this story. So we know here in this part that David is on the run from Saul. That's where we are. Okay. David has already been anointed as the next king. And here's what's happening. I'm going to set this up. You were in first Samuel chapter 22. In the first couple verses, all we're going to read here, I just want to set up the stage for you for where he's at and what's going on. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all, the other, and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented, until David was the captain of about 400 men. So David goes from Gath to Adalom, okay? And uh, one thing that I think is really interesting is I, you know, I was pulling up the maps in my Bible and looking on, you know, Google because it shows me all the things. And I was looking to see where these places were in relation to where King Saul would have been and like why he was choosing these locations. But one thing that I thought was interesting is that when he goes from Gath, which Gath was a prominent Philistine city. It was like the major Philistine city of the time. So he's already in enemy territory, and this is where he's gone to hide, is in enemy territory. But when he goes from Gath to Adalom, to me, from looking at the map, it looks to me as if he probably passed by the Valley of Elah, which that is where he had already had victory over Goliath, the Philistine. And so I'm just imagining that he's going from one place to another. He's re being reminded of that victory that he had already had. So he has to look through this place and this time, this season where he's hiding, where he's discontent, where he's kind of in the waiting and he's walking through this area and I'm sure that he probably passed by familiar territory where he had once had victory and he's sitting there looking at this land where he had had such an exciting encounter with not his own ability, his own flesh, his own self, but with the, with the God of Israel who worked through him in that, in that story that we read of, of David and Goliath where it wasn't David, it was David in his willingness and in his obedience, but it was the God of Israel that worked through David to bring great victory in his life. And now he, knowing that he is anointed and set apart by that same God, is having to hide in this season of waiting. And he's, he's, he's traveling through from Gath to, to this cave where he's going to hide out, right? And so I wonder, though, I wonder if it was a painful reminder to him to be reminded of that past victory when he was in this season of hiding. I wonder, was that painful? Was that difficult to see it? Or was it encouragement? I really don't know because I'm not David. I can't tell you. But I can imagine that either of those scenarios is likely that either it, it was stirred up in a, this moment of like, man, I remember what it was like to feel like I was on, 
you know, the top. And now here I am tucked away, hiding, just waiting for the Lord to do something. Or maybe it was an encouragement from one way to another to say, right now, this is the season of hiding. But God, I remember your faithfulness. I remember what you did through me. I know what the promise is. I know that you've got a plan for me. I know that I'm anointed. I know that I'm set apart. I've seen you bring the victory once. I know I can see you bring the victory again. And here I am walking through the valley, but I know that this valley is a testament to your faithfulness. And and that while even when I'm in the hiding, I can trust that on the other side of the hiding is the, the part two of the story, right? So here he goes. He's traveling through. He's going to the cave. So I wonder, and I'm wondering about your story, and I'm wondering what you're thinking. I'm wondering if you're looking back at the past victories, and you're looking at God's involvement, or you're looking at your own. Because if I look at my past victories with myself as the main character in the story, I can be discouraged by how things look now as opposed to how they looked then. Because I can feel like I'm not enough, I can't do that, I can't get back to that place, something's going wrong, this is a mess, I don't know how I'm ever, you know, that was my peak, I can't ever come back up from this, this is it. And when I look back to those past victories with myself as the hero in the story, then there's a problem and there's a disconnect. And I'm going to walk away looking at that valley as, a, as discouraged and I'm going to walk away feeling defeated. I'm going to feel like a failure. But let me tell you what, if I look at my past victories with God as the main character of the story, I am encouraged that the same God who won my victories yesterday is the same God today, is the same God that will be winning my victories tomorrow and next year and five years from now. Because let me tell you, you are a part of the story, but God is the main character of this story. And he is the one who your eyes need to be looking to. Because if I look back to my past victories and I see that Katie did that, then I have failed. I am wrong in that thinking because if I choose to glorify myself in those victories, then I put the emphasis on myself going forward. But I can tell you that I know that David was a man after God's own heart, and I believe that he had to have been somebody who was looking back knowing it wasn't just little old me and that Philistine that won that battle. It was little old me, a big old God in that Philistine that won that battle. And let me tell you what, right now, I want to encourage you that when you're walking through this season of hiding, of being tucked away, a season of seclusion, that God is wanting your face and your attention to be looking right at him because he wants to remind you that he is the God of your victory. He is the God of your triumph. He is the God of your success. And if you start to put that on you, then you can be sure that you're about to fall. Amen. So even as he was walking into hiding, he was reminded of God's victory. He was reminded of the God of victory. He was reminded of not just a God who was a victorious one time, but a God that is victorious now and forever. He was reminded that this is not just the God who gave him a promise, but this is the God of promise. And so sometimes for us, we need to be reminded that this is not just a God who did a one-time thing in your life a long time ago, but this is the God who is the God of victory in your life now and forever. Gath was a major Philistine city. He had already been hanging out in enemy territory, but I have to wonder, why did he find comfort being tucked away in enemy territory? I, I don't understand where that was the, the decision for comfort, but I know in the time that's where he found himself. He was tucked away in enemy territory, hiding from Saul. I don't know, but what I read in that, those couple of verses is that he wasn't the only one who found comfort being tucked away in enemy territory because he ended up going into hiding with an army of 400 people. And it said that they, they all came that because they were in trouble, they were in debt, or they were discontented. They all had problems that they were running and hiding from. And so they all find themselves to be a part of King David's now army when they were just folks who were running from their discontentment into hiding. And as I've been looking through this story, I've been thinking a lot about how we need to take a deeper look at the toll that 2020 has done on our spiritual lives. Because I think that 2020 and all of its ups and downs, even into 2021, we just keep saying 2020, but let me tell you, COVID wasn't over in January. Um, we all felt like we were still tucked away in, in the beginning of this year, but I think we need to take a deeper look at the toll that 2020 had on our spiritual lives. And now that we're emerging 
out of the darkness that was this last year, I think it's time we take a healthy examination at our spiritual lives. And I think it's time that we make the determination that we're going to get back on track. And so as I look at this story, I've been thinking a lot about how we've all allowed ourselves to live secluded. Now, I know a lot of y'all have been in this house, and we've had these doors open uh, a lot more than some other places have during this season, and I know that a lot of y'all have been here, but I know that the majority of us has still somehow landed ourselves in living secluded lives, whether that's in a physical sense or just in an emotional, mental, spiritual sense. We've allowed the season to seclude us and keep us away in hiding. What started as a means for safety turned into a platform for the enemy to hide away the anointed of God. What started as a means for safety for David, we can see that it was the anointed of God tucked away. Now for a season, that was important. For a season, that was necessary. But was it necessary for David to stay tucked away and hiding forever? No, that would have been silly. That would have been a really lame ending to this story. There once was a dude named David, was anointed as king, beat a Philistine, and then got scared and hid in a cave for the rest of his life. The end. Let me tell you, First and Second Samuel would be a whole lot shorter, right? We probably could have read it all this morning. But at some point, there was time for that hiding to end, Right? But the time came for him to come out of hiding. So when did David emerge from the hiding? It was after Saul died, right? So 2 Samuel, um, if you just flip over, it's not that much further away, but it's in a whole other book. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. Here's a conversation that David has with the Lord. And it says, after this, David asked the Lord, should I move back to one of the towns of Judah? Yes, the Lord replied. Then David asked, which town should I go to? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So this is just, like I said, we can't get into the whole story, but this is just a quick interaction that David had with the Lord. So Saul has died. The threat has left. It's time to come into position to step fully into what God has anointed him for, right? Now, what I love and what I respect about the story of David and his season of waiting is that he chooses over and over again to not take matters into his own hands. He has lots of opportunity to try to do this his own way, right? And if you know this story, and I know there's going to be people in the, in the room who don't know the story, but if you are not familiar with the story, again, I encourage you to go and read it, but in the story, he has multiple opportunities. Now, he... For those of you who haven't picked up yet, um, I always do this because I was that kid in church who was like, y'all know the story. And I was like, I do not know the story. So, um, so he was hiding from Saul, who was the current king, because he was jealous of David, who was angry with David, wanted to kill David. And we know it's because of the anointing that was on David's life. And Saul was aware of that. And so as David had to hide, he had opportunities where he could have killed Saul himself but he chose to not do it because he understood that God's anointing was without having to fight for it on his own. Like he knew that God's anointing was final and that he didn't need to take matters into his own hands to see if he could just work his way up into that position that he wanted. He had a trust that if God has put some, somebody in authority, then it's not my time. It's, it's my time to, to wait and that God's will for my life is right now, even if it doesn't look like I'm in that position, I think I'm going to be in. And so he chose, and that's one thing I love and I respect about David's story, is that he chose not to take matters into his own hands. Even though David knew he would become king, and although time seemed right right here, where he could move back into Judah, David still consulted with God. He still chose to put a pause on the story. Even though Saul was dead, the threat was gone. It wasn't an immediate, okay, this just makes sense. Let's just go on back. This was a moment where he was like, hey, this relationship is way more important than my position as king, than my position as a leader. This relationship is way more important than the rest of that. And so he still chose to pause and consult God on what the next steps were. And sometimes I think that whenever we are trying to navigate uh, different seasons in our lives, we think we just need to flow with what makes sense, what comes next naturally. And sometimes we forget to stop and pause and say, God, 
Should I do this? Should I go there? Should I take this next step? Should I be a part of this thing? And let me tell you, even though in this situation, what he was feeling and what he was sensing was accurate and the Lord confirmed that, there's a lot of situations in our lives where if we would just pause for a second and consult the Lord, that he would give us some direction and he would give us um, an awareness of maybe some things that we're not seeing because we haven't opened ourselves up to the spiritual. We want to do what feels feels good and what feels good in the natural we want to just flow with whatever that is but let me tell you there is some some victory in your life when you choose to just stop and consult God for a second and so even though it made sense David paused and he consulted God and God gave him clear direction of specifically where he needed to go next right and I think that's so important that we choose to take that moment and consult the Lord sometimes before moving ahead seems obvious we need to first bring that matter to God who alone knows the best timing the best decision and sometimes we can just move into the next thing thinking it makes sense with what God has told us prior so it just makes sense for us to move on forward right but that's not always the case and David although he was anointed he never manipulated God's timing by trying to do things in his own timing David was very aware that he was not the main character in this story. And I think a lot of times we want to pretend as if we are the main character in the story of life and that God is just a piece to our puzzle that we can manipulate in order to get ourselves where we want to go. But when you start to look at yourself less as the main character and more as a supporting character who's, who's coming alongside the plan and the will of God, you begin to see yourself as less important. And you begin to see that the gospel has more importance in your life than, than your own plan, your own will. And that begins to take first place. When you move out of that position as the main character and you allow the Lord to take his rightful place then the story of your life is a story of victory and of freedom and of power because that's where it's found when he's the one who's made the main story. But can I remind you that just as David chose not to do things in his own timing, that the same God that David served is the same God that you served. And can I remind you that 2020 didn't change who God is. He is the God of victory, the same God of victory that he was before. And let me tell you, I know that last year was, was rough and it made us all feel weird and we came out of it feeling a little different than we went into it. But let me tell you what a small glimpse of time that that was in the grand scheme of God's story. And I think that the enemy would like you to take such a small glimpse of time and build your whole faith and theology around it because where was God in that and what was going on and why did God allow that to happen? Or maybe there's other momentary isolated events in your life that you've tried to allow your theology and your relationship with God to be written around those small momentary things that happened in your life but God's wanting you to see the bigger picture and the full story right so at David's as David's landmark of victory reminds him of God's faithfulness when he walked through that valley I'm sure that he recognized this is an area of God's faithfulness, can I remind you that who God has been before 2020 is the same God he is now? And can I tell someone this morning that 2020 might have been a year of hiding and of seclusion, but what I believe has happened when, when Saul died and David was ready to start positioning himself to emerge, I believe that the Lord is positioning us now to emerge from hiding. And if we allow ourselves to go deeper in him, we will come out of hiding stronger and more ready to step into that anointing that we had before 2020 even happened. And let me tell you, as the Lord wants to emerge you out of hiding, he's positioning you towards the anointing that was already on your life, whether you knew it or not. And I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about what it looks like to emerge from hiding. Because what may have been tucked away for a season is ready to be brought back into vision. Right? So what are we talking about this morning? 
I'm talking about the fact that your calling has been in hiding. Your purpose has been in hiding. Your story has been in hiding. Your anointing has been in hiding. And because all of that, because all of that has been allowed to be tucked away and in hiding, the gospel has been in hiding. Why? Because God has chosen us to be the wheelhouse for where the gospel goes. And if we choose another year, another month even, to sit back and allow our calling to be tucked away in hiding, there are souls attached to that calling. There are people's lives at stake that are attached to your anointing, that God has purposed you Listen, you can bring them to church all day long, but there are people who are specifically attached to the calling that God placed on your life. And if you allow yourself to be tucked away in hiding, what's going to happen to those souls? What's going to happen to the lives that are connected to you that are supposed to be brought into the kingdom because of your specific calling? Because what the Lord has equipped you to do. You may say, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a worship leader. I don't care about any of that. I know that the call that God has placed on your life is just as valid and important as the, God, the calling that God has placed on my life. And that he knit you together with such intricate purpose. Why? Because there's a place for you in the kingdom of God. Why? Because there's people that only you can reach. Why? Because your calling has immense purpose in the kingdom of God. And whenever you allow yourself to be hidden away in seclusion, there are souls at the other end of that calling that are going to be without now do I believe that God's will will be done regardless yeah God God will find a way but do you want to be part of that story or do you want to be off over here somewhere trying to do whatever it is that you're doing to make yourself the main character in God's story and just bringing him along for the ride so you can have a nice car and a fancy house and cool shoes like I don't want anything to do with my own wants, my own desires. What I want is for God, who knows me so well because he made me it's so incredibly unique, to, to line up that anointing that he already placed on my life and allow me to come out of hiding and walk fully in the calling that he has on my life so that way the people that I'm supposed to t touch, the people that I'm supposed to minister to, the people that I'm supposed to encourage can be connected to my part of the story and ultimately his story is the one that gets the most attention. Because if I'm just the supporting character, then I know that even though I'm not the main character, my place in his story is important. We are how God chooses to move the gospel. We are how God chooses to, to share his word. He has given us a, a holy responsibility to seek him and then to seek out the call that he has on our lives. There is no more looking at yourself as simply ordinary. There is no more time to tuck your anointing away in hiding. There is no more time to tuck away your gifting in hiding. The Lord is saying that now is time to emerge from hiding, to come out of the shadowy places. Your faith cannot live in the shadows. There is no more time for you to come to church on Sunday and your faith live in the shadows the rest of the week because the rest of the people around you have no idea that you're serving the Lord because you've allowed your faith, your anointing, your relationship with God to be tucked away in a secret place. The Lord is saying it is time for that thing to emerge from hiding because because the Lord is ready to use it. He's ready for your anointing to be the, 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 the wheels that take the gospel to the nations. He's ready for your anointing to be what brings the gospel to your workplace. He's ready for your anointing to be the wheels that brings the gospel to the streets. He's ready for you to step in to that holy anointing just as David emerged from hiding, consulted with the Lord, and then he took steps right towards that thing that God had laid before him. It would have been silly for David to stay hiding when it was time for him to become king. But yet we look at our own lives and we don't see any good reason for us to seek out what God has called us to do, what our place is in his kingdom. There are too many people who are comfortable sitting in a church pew on a Sunday morning and having no other service to his kingdom the rest of the week. 
too many, and, and I'm not going to, you know, there, we have amazing volunteers in this church, but sometimes I think as a pastor, and be mad at me if you want to, I think it's a little ridiculous how much we have to beg people to want to be a part of what God's doing in this house. Like, come on. Like, there are too many opportunities for you to serve in a way that's unique to your gifting and your calling for y'all to just come in and rather sit in a pew and keep, keep a seat warm. That's not a ministry we need help with. Like, we don't need seat warmers, right? What I'm looking for are some people that whether it's in this house or it's outside of these four walls who are ready to say that I know that I might not be a preacher, I might not be a worship leader, I might not be X, Y, and Z, but I know that there is something that God created for me to have purpose in the kingdom of God and in this house. If this house is your home, there's a place for you to serve. There's a place for you to be connected. Because at the center of what God has anointed you to do, there are people he designed your calling to reach. There's people he designed your calling to reach. And I think it's a perfect opportunity to be reminded that this morning, not to take any, you know, honor away, Pastor Josh is an incredible pastor and leader. Amen. We have an incredible pastor. But did you notice how the Holy Spirit still worked even though he wasn't in the building this morning? Isn't that crazy how like that one guy who does all the stuff wasn't here and the stuff still happened, right? Because if we feel like the, the serving the Lord is reduced and it can only be done by one person who can preach, you know, till snot comes out and he can, you know, jump a pew and kick somebody, he does that thing, you know, I'm in a dress, so I'm going to do it this way, that thing that he does. Uh, if we think that only one person can walk boldly after their anointing, then we're mistaken because I don't know what that was this morning, but he wasn't even in the building. But the same Holy Spirit that works through him is the same one in this place, working through Trisha, working through the worship team, working through the hungry people in this house who are in the altars this morning, seeking the face of God. That expectancy of knowing that God's about to do something in your life is what makes the difference. Right? It doesn't matter who's in the building. We all could be gone. You could just be up in here having church. Because the same Holy Spirit that works in him was in this house. Amen? Your faith cannot be hidden in the shadows. And I just want to remind you of that. It's time to emerge your faith from hiding, okay? And as we look through into the New Testament, you know, that was like an Old Testament example of somebody trying to, uh, you know, step into that anointing, but they had to have that season of seclusion. I want you guys to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, and we're going um, to, we're going to talk a little bit about Paul and in this, this entire passage here, well, this whole book, I mean, not just the passage, but the entire book, Paul is writing from prison. How many of you all know that it is not a newfangled idea for the enemy to try to seclude the anointed? And it's not something that ended when Paul was released from prison either. It is not a new tactic or a new idea. But when we read this uh, instruction from Paul to Timothy, we, we have to read it knowing that Paul was imprisoned. He was secluded away. But yet the anointed of God will still go forth. Amen? So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, eat, now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Now it says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. So pause for just a second. I love that example in, in verse, verses 3 and 4 
where he talks about how we have to endure in this time and that we cannot get caught up in the affairs of civilian life. A lot of times we just want to be tucked away in our own little bubble of our own little lives, and we don't want to invite God's plan into any of it. But he says, listen, if you're going to be a good soldier that's taking commands then you're going to be one who has to forsake civilian life and be focused only on the commands of the Father, right? Because I don't know about y'all, I've never been to boot camp, but I just kind of have an idea that if I showed up to boot camp one day and it was like, hey, I'm going to hang out for a bit, but I think this afternoon I'm going to just, you know, go to the mall and try on some shoes or something. Like, I have a feeling that the drill sergeant probably isn't going to like me very much. And... I'm probably going to be hurting real bad after that day, right? But sometimes I think that we can get that way when it comes to what God is trying to do in our lives. We can say, okay, God, I'm here for a little bit, but after a while I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head out and I'm going to go do my thing and then I'll see you Sunday, same time, same place, me and you, right? But I don't think it works that way. I don't think that that's what the Lord has set up for us to be doing, Right? So he, he makes that very clear that we cannot be caught up in civilian life. Are we too busy living life that we have forsaken the gospel, that we have forsaken our anointing, that we have forsaken our calling? Are we too caught up in our civilian life that we forget that we are a soldier in the army of God? So reading on verse 8, it says, Always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news that I preach. And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. He reminds us that he's been put into hiding, into seclusion, because of the anointing that was on his life. Because I've chosen to preach the gospel, the enemy has tried to tuck me away and chain me like a criminal. But here's the part. Here's the game changer, y'all. But the word of God cannot be chained. So I will cling. I am willing. I will cling to anything that will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. He says, listen, they may try to physically restrain me. They may try to physically place me into seclusion. But let me tell you what the gospel that God has, the good news cannot be chained. The word of God that that has final authority above all other things cannot be tucked away. And let me tell you what, you have an option. Are you going to allow the enemy to put you into seclusion? Are you going to choose that you are going to allow the gospel to be unchained in your life? Because Paul had the opportunity to say, oh, well, this is the hand I've been dealt. I guess I'm just stuck here in seclusion. I guess I'm just stuck here in hiding. I guess I'm just stuck here in prison. And he was, you know, taken against his will, but it was because of the anointing on his life. And I know that there are so many people in this room watching online that are called and anointed and set apart with a purpose by the king of kings, but they've allowed the enemy to feed them lies that this is where that they need to just stay tucked away. But the season of seclusion needs to end because the gospel will not be chained. And God's plan will not wait around for anybody. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of what God's doing. I want to be a part of that gospel going forth. I want to be a part of his obedient children who are choosing to come and emerge out of hiding. So he wrote this from prison. They tried to put his anointing and the gospel in seclusion. And then it goes on to verses 11 to 13. It says, this is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. But listen to this part. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. 
There is no denying who our God is. He is the same God that he was yesterday. He's the same God that was there for David. He's the same God that was there for Paul. And he's the same God that is there for you. But that last verse makes it very clear that whether or not we remain faithful, he will remain faithful. That lets me know that whether or not I want to be a part of his story, his story is going to go on. But I have to think that the God of the universe who is intentional who thought that it was worthwhile to create the sun, the moon, and the stars, more stars than we can even count, thought it was worthwhile to create you. And why did he do that? Because he had a purpose for you in his story. But being the loving God that he is, he gives us a free will, and he allows us to choose whether or not we want to step into the role that he's given us. And there's so many times that I see people who have such incredible callings on their lives who allow themselves to stay in a season of seclusion because of fear, because of worry, because of hurt, because of bitterness, because of heartache, whatever it is. They allow themselves to stay in a season of seclusion and rob themselves of getting to be a part of God's story. And it's heartbreaking to watch as a pastor, to watch people that you love and you care about and you see that potential in their life. You see that those things that God has called them to do and then you watch them choose seclusion. But I know this morning there are so many of you that God is inviting to emerge out of seclusion because he can do it without you, but he doesn't want to. He wants you to be a part of what he's doing. He wants you to invite, he wants to invite you in to use those intricate details that he programmed you with for the furthering of the gospel because your calling is so important. God will be God and he will be faithful. His will will be done whether or not you want to be a part of it, but he invites you to. So here's what I, I want to know. What evidence of the gospel are other people seeing in your life? Has your faith been so tucked away in the shadows that people around you have have not seen any evidence of the impact that the gospel had on your life? Because I don't know about you, but whenever I encountered salvation, I haven't been able to keep my mouth shut about it since. Like, I mean, I'm not going to keep my mouth shut anyway, but I mean. I don't know how I felt about that one, Lorraine. Um, Anyway, so I don't know about you guys, but ever since I encountered salvation, something's been a little different on the inside of me. A whole lot different on the inside of me. And let me tell you that I am not a perfect person. I make mistakes more than I'd like to admit. I am not a perfect pastor. I'm not a perfect leader. And there's a lot of times that I have to confront those things that I am not perfect at. But let me tell you that I can say with confidence that when somebody looks at my life, there is evidence of the gospel. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing different folks knowing their stories, knowing how they live their lives. And I know there are several people in this room that the gospel is evident. But I'm talking to those of you who tuck away any evidence of the gospel in your life and you live your day-to-day ordinarily. I wonder, have you really encountered the same gospel that I have? Because let me tell you what, when I heard about salvation, when I heard about what Jesus did for me, there was no more being quiet about it. There was no more tucking it away because if I was rescued, why would I not want you to be rescued? If I was delivered, why would I not want you to be delivered? And let me tell you, there is a selfishness that the enemy would have for you to keep the gospel tucked away because he knows the life changing power of the gospel. And what he's inviting you to do is to share some evidence of the gospel in your life. Now, I'm not saying you have to get the microphone and preach. You don't have to stand on the street 
street corner. Lord knows you wouldn't want to hear some people standing on the street corner. But let me tell you, there is an evidence about the gospel in your life that should be visible for anybody who comes in contact with you. And if you have chosen to allow that aspect of your life to stay in hiding, we got a problem. And I'm, ex- I'm excited this morning because I feel like there's some people in this house who are, who are going to accept the invitation for the gospel to be made evident in their lives, in their workplace, in their homes, with their families. There's going to be no more shame or fear or worry surrounding it. And, and allowing the gospel to be evident in your life is not saying that I'm a perfect person who has it all together all the time. It's saying that, thank you, God, that in my imperfection, you were perfect. Thank you, God, that in my shortcoming and failure, you've never failed once. Thank you, God, that whenever I've made a mistake, God, you have never once made a mistake, nor will you ever. And it's partnering with knowing that the imperfection in me needs the perfect God to come alongside me and that the anointing on my life has nothing to do with me it has to do with the God that chose me to be a part of his story so let me tell you this morning that if you are choosing to tuck away the gospel in the shadows of your life you are missing out on a divine opportunity to partner with the God of of heaven and of earth who wants to move mountains through your story because the people around you are hearing your story and they need to see the evidence of the gospel in your life. And I think about it sometimes, I think about how we've made hiding away a little bit too easy. If you think about it, and you know, I mean, we're guilty of this as anybody, but in a lot of churches, what do we do when we invite people to salvation? We dim the lights, we close our eyes, nobody's looking around. You can make a decision for Jesus right here. Nobody has to see you do it ever. Listen, I understand. I know why we do. We want people to feel comfortable and not feel embarrassed. But if you can't make a decision for Christ in the light in a church that's surrounded by people who are supporting you and cheering you on, how in the world are you going to stand for Christ when you're out in the world? Let me tell you what. I think that our Father is looking for some bold followers of Jesus, not people who are only able to commit to Christ in the shadows, in the darkness, when the lights are turned down, when everybody's eyes are closed. But let me tell you, I want some people in this house who are willing to serve the Lord to step into their anointing when the lights are on full blast when the spotlight is on let me tell you there's some people who have only allowed their faith to be seen in the shadows but this morning it is time to emerge out of hiding people it's time to get out in the dark world because your light cannot stay entrapped in darkness I believe that God is done with us choosing to only declare ourselves as followers in the darkness, in the shadows. But when push comes to shove and your faith has to be in the spotlight, we cower and we back away and pretend like we don't know his name. But let me tell you, the condition that our world is in leaving 2020, there is no time or allowance for you to keep the gospel in the shadows. Let me tell you what, I'm over the dim lights and the closed eyes and the nobody look at me, nobody know that God is moving on my heart. Let me tell you, oh, men in the room, let me tell you what, I'm over men in this house who act like it is not a manly thing to be in love with Jesus. Why is it that we can act like... We are too tough to raise our hands. We're too tough to say I love you to our Father. Let me tell you what, there is nothing weak or emotional about a man who knows his purpose. Men of God, you are being called to not just love the Lord in this house, but outside of the four walls. But if you feel awkward loving the Lord right here, how are you going to stand in your workplace? Come on. Sorry, guys. I know that, that that's not a fun word to hear, and I'm not expecting everybody to worship the way that I worship, but I want you to know that there is nothing weak about a man who's in love with Jesus. Nothing weak about it. 